almost time. I was just saying to Arta here, it's the, uh, it's the anticipation, isn't it? It's the exciting bit about concerts and festivals and that sort of stuff. I'm expecting a drum technician to come in at any moment and check everything's working. But good morning, welcome, and uh, thanks for having us here today. Um, before I introduce our panel, my name's Jonathan Overend. Um, I'm predominantly a sports broadcaster. I've worked for the BBC for 25 years or so, but I'm also a massive music fan and festival goer, so I feel like my whole life has been immersed in live events, whether that be business or pleasure. And actually, uh, a, a couple of things have happened over the last couple of years which have really made this whole discussion very relevant to me. Um, my daughters actually went to a festival here in the UK a couple of years ago, my teenage daughters. Um, it was in Swindon in Wiltshire, all the glamour. Um, and Dizzy Rascal was just coming to the end of his set when this huge electrical storm comes over Swindon, and this is in July, by the way, uh, or it might have been August, actually, but in the height of the English summer, anyway, and a huge electrical storm, whole site gets evacuated. And it, it really makes you think, I wasn't there, I'm a parent sitting at home, and of course, number one, I'm thinking of my daughters, are they safe, are they going to be all right? And number two, you're thinking, well, actually, what sort of provision does this event have to look after thousands and thousands of people in the really, really unlikely event of a huge electrical storm in the middle of the English summer. And I suppose when we talk about adapting to the new climate, one of the things we're gonna get into is the, the unpredictability of our climate now, but also the, the extremes, you know, the extreme floods, the extreme temperatures. I mean, only last summer we hit 40 degrees in the UK for the first time ever. And I mean, did we ever think in the UK we would experience temperatures like that. So, so that got me thinking from my sort of like um, personal interest of music and festivals. But then from my professional side of things, I was at the Australian Open Tennis a few years back where they hit above 40 degrees Celsius for four days in a row. And we, you know, we now know what 40 degrees feels like because we had it here in the UK last summer. But now imagine playing sport in that. Imagine being inside an arena with all that metal um, you know, ar around the stands and the, the court surface. And then you know, if you're playing NFL or cricket, you can add on the equipment and the, the clothing. And you suddenly think to yourself, wow, how is, this, how is this sustainable, the way we're going? And of course, the answer is it isn't. So I decided to start a podcast which I called Emergency on Planet Sport, which I've been running for a couple of years now. Um, and we try to join the dots between sport and climate change. And I think what's really interesting is there is certainly from a sporting point of view, this huge disconnect, A, between the people who work in the operations side, and I'm sure there are lots of people in the room today who work in operations at festivals and events, you know, really well-intentioned, doing loads of great work, but then there is this disconnect between the organisation as a whole. I'm talking from a sports point of view here, because we still see clubs, governing bodies, events, aligning themselves with massive carbon polluters. And you think, okay, how, how do you align those, those two aspects? But then you've also got the disconnect between sport saying, well, we're entertainment, we're a release for folk, to go on a Saturday afternoon, meet their friends, have a beer, watch the football, get away from the worries of the world. And actually, what we're talking about today, which is the very existence of entertainment. So there is this really interesting disconnect, I think. And I'm very interested here today to see where we are in sport compared with where we are in music and the arts. So um, we'll open it up for questions for about the last 10, 15 minutes or so. So if there's anything on your mind, save it, bottle it, and we'll come to you in a bit. But I will introduce our panel here today. Uh, we have Jane Healy, who is Sanitation Manager for Glastonbury, uh, Water, Waste and Toilet Manager for the Boomtown Fair. All the glamour, all the glamour. <laughs> but basically, Jane, you've worked in the, in the UK festival world for, uh, for a long time now and can give us a, a lot of insight, I'm sure, over your years of experience. In the middle, we have Rick Robbins. Now, Rick has another impressive job title. He is Head of Operational Expertise Propositions at the Met Office. I don't know what that means. It looks like you don't know what that means either. But basically, 
He knows his stuff. He, he's worked at the Met Office for 40 years, so we'll come to Rick in a minute for an overview of where we are with the, with the climate. And Arta Mendes here, uh, direct from Portugal. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Arta, flying in. One of the co-managers of Boom Festival and Being Gathering as well. And I know you're going to tell us a lot about those events and what you're doing in a few minutes' time. So, Rick, to, to you first of all, with your, with your weatherman hat on, <laughs> where are we? Adapting to the new climate. What, what is the new climate? Where have we come from? Where are we now? And where are we heading? So, um, <clears throat> as you heard, I joined the Met Office 40 years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, very much on the operational side, forecasting side. Um, I'd just like to point out you could leave school at 12 back then, but okay, that's not <laughs> quite true. <coughs> um, so, we, we, from the operational side, you, 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 you were dealing with weather that um, was, you know, relatively stable. You had your seasonal extremes, you had, uh, you know, daily weather, different weather every day. But um, over the last sort of few years, we've started to see events that we haven't seen before in the UK and, and obviously across, across the, the world as well. You mentioned um, 40 degrees Celsius. Um, I never thought in my career that I would see the UK hit 40 degrees Celsius and that's as a, an operational forecaster looking at the weather on a day-to-day -day basis. When we break records, temperature records in particular, it's usually by 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of a degree and happens every 10, 20 years. Um, last summer, we broke the heat records by a degree and a half not just in one place, but in a number of places from the southeast through the Midlands and up the eastern side of the country. That's a one and a half degree jump in one weather event. And it followed on from a heat wave earlier in the summer. So if you listen to, to what our climate scientists say, they talk about um, seeing more extremes. Um, so when we think about things like thunderstorms and torrential rain, the sort of things that lead to flash flooding, the thoughts are that you're going to see that probably 30% more often. And by 2050, 40 degrees in the UK is likely to happen every three years. So where, when I first started, climate science, climate change was something that the scientists upstairs thought about and worried about and did a lot of work on. I think now we're starting to have to deal with it in an operational way on a day-to-day -day basis. Totally, totally. So I think what we really want to get into in this session is the impact of this on creating and delivering events, you know, how we can adapt, how we are adapting, and how we're going to need to adapt even further. So, Jane, if we come to you from your Glastonbury and Boomtown experience, I mean, how do you prepare for those extremes when one summer we're having flash floods and the next summer we're having 40 degrees and, and drought? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, from sort of the beginning of my sort of career in the event industry, weather has played such a major sort of part of it. Sort of my first event um, was Sunrise 2008 and it was cancelled as the gates opened because of flash flooding. And then you go forward to this year, la sorry, last year with Boomtown and we had um, the extreme heat. So it's, it is hard to prepare because you don't know which way it is going to go. The only way I feel the best way to prepare is to really know your land. If you're a sort of a green sort of festival, sort of grassroots and it's sort of knowing how your land reacts to the different weathers whether it be flash flooding whether it be wind and whether it be heat and it's sort of having that resilience within your knowledge of um, your land I think will play a major part. Mm. Arta that, that's something you'd agree with I would imagine you you own the land right w on which your festivals are based in Portugal tell us a bit more. Well, yeah, I think there is, in this debate, there, is, there are things that we can control and things that we cannot control. For sure, the climate change, the natural variables, we cannot control. But we can control how to deal with them. So, for instance, what we are facing in, in Portugal is drought, extreme drought, very often. This is on a year basis. Uh, water scarcity, uh, wildfires, and this has led us to um, things, for instance, we are moving back the dates of the festival. Um, the things that we can control, uh, <laughs> uh, facing the things that we cannot control, for instance, water. There is a scarcity of water, and what we are doing now is developing technologies that are more resilient so that we can treat the water that are provided from the grid, 
retaining the water, improve the regeneration, and hopefully after treatment, introducing these into the shower circuit. If we want to do reforestation and regeneration, we are putting species that are more resilient that require less water. So I think that is an ongoing um, <coughs> trial and error thing. Um, what we face is that the policy makers are not always aligned with the, um, with the needs, with the, with the emergency that we are facing. So for instance, in Portugal, what is happening is due to the amount of wildfires that we are uh, facing on a year basis, they are preventing things to happen in forest areas, which has a negative impact in terms of producing events, in terms of looking at culture in, the, in the cultural sector and how to bring the cultural sector to go into the forest areas so that we can create new kinds of events in nationwide. Mm. So um, one of the most important things with the having ownership of the land is not only knowing the land, but in which way we can influence the new technologies to deal with the things that we cannot control. I would say this, this is a, the major takeaway. Okay, well, we'll hear a lot more about those technologies in just a minute. Uh, Arthur mentioned wildfires there, Rick. How much of a problem was that here in the UK summer before last? Yeah, it's, um, <coughs> it's become notable, the um, number of incidents and how, how these uh, are ramping up. So, so what we're getting is, is um, milder winters, wetter winters, which encourages plant growth. And particularly this time of year, you've probably noticed that the, the plants are, are starting to really go mad already, which gives you a lot of growth. So a lot of new wood, a lot of leaves. Of course, when you then get uh, hot conditions and dry conditions in the summer, that dries out and it becomes the catalyst that you need um, for wildfires. And wildfires happen, they're, they're a natural thing, they're man-made thing, but I guess what we're looking at is the scale of those. So all of the ingredients are there um, in our current um, sort of weather setup, the current climate, um, for wildfires to become, you know, quite significant events. And, and last, when we, when we had the heat waves and the temperatures uh, reaching 40 degrees, uh, one of the most significant impacts of that was the, how spreadable wildfires were. There was a lot of fuel there, there was a lot of dry, all the conditions were right, and it caused a lot of problems. How, how conscious are you, Jane, of that at Boomtown? Because that, that day came just before the festival yeah, last summer? Yeah, during the build. Um, during the build. At, at Boomtown, it was that extreme heat. And the, sort of the heat continued, as we know, in that summer. Um, um, you, you realize how different you brief your crews now, because obviously, in the past, you'd be sort of telling them to make sure they've got wet weather, sort of clothing ready in case of um, bad weather. But now you're actually briefing your crews to look out for signs such as wildfires, you know, sort of, you've got procedures in place now for that happening, and I think that's going to become more and more common at events where it's part of your event management plans that will be included, like flood risks are often part of event management plans. I think in this country, is, as you're saying, if we're going to see these extreme heats more and more, it will be something that will be the norm to be prepared for, thing, you know, looking out for things like wildfires. Yeah, and what about water provision, you know, in uh, years like that? It was pretty full on at Boomtown, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Where's, um, where's it all come from? <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, the local area had a hosepipe ban, so th that has obviously a knock-on effect to the water you're getting into the site. You're having to get in more water. It's, it costs more when you have extreme weathers. Whichever way it goes, it's always going to cost you more, and there always has to be that knowledge in your budget that if there is an extreme weather, it might not just be you know more trackways for flooding. It could be bringing in more water, because... Suddenly, people, are, everyone's drinking more, but you're also dampening down the, the roads more. You're also, um, you know, we were using mist guns at Boomtown to sort of cool down the crew, the, the audience in front of stages. So all of a sudden, your water usage has gone through the roof, and you have to, and it's the time you need it the most. You know, you can't have a site running out of water when you've got such extreme heat. So it becomes critical, and it's, you know, it's planning, making sure that you're always planning for now. I, I, I feel those extreme heats because we just don't know which way it's ever going to go. I suppose that sort of brings us back to this idea of a disconnect in a way between the, the impact. You know, we're talking there, Arthur, about the impact of this changing climate on our events, but actually all the time we're all contributing and big corporate corporations are partnering, as I say, with, with carbon emitters without 
much concern, it seems, about the impact that is going on. So where, where is, how can we get more connection between those two things, do you think? Well, I think it's, it's like in life, we need to find our purpose. And in, in the Boom Festival, the purpose is to transform people and to regenerate the land. And uh, this is one of the advantages of doing an independent festival that we don't need to really focus on uh, working with brands or with even municipalities that are not aligned with our values. Plus, if we follow a, 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 a principles like we follow, like the permaculture principles, then we have a, a, like a toolkit that support us to work with the land and never against the land. And this can allow us to find, uh, let's say, a, a, a way, a roadmap in terms of mitigating the problems of climate change, but also to try to reframe climate change on a positive way. Because, for instance, when we do the festival, we are the second biggest city in the region around Boom. 40,000 people, people from all over the world, and with the technologies that we are using, for instance, with water circularity, with compost toilets, we can show that a 40,000 people city can work out some issues. For instance, treating all the water, uh, using sanitation that can make soil. This soil can create vegetable gardens. These gardens can kill the population. So I think the toolkit is there. The system is not changing. So this disconnect, we all know, or is global, is worldwide. But the technologies are there. And once again, as Claire was saying, festivals have been showing worldwide also ways to deal with this. And now that we have climate change, once again, we have many toolkits that are making a good uh, showcase for the society to pick them up and to apply them. Well, that's where I think you know my, my sector, sport, can learn a lot from music, arts, and the events industry as well. Because you know, you're saying you're an event with purpose, and uh, you know, lots of events in the room today will have purpose you know, right at the forefront of their existence. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're both football fans, aren't we? And you know, some clubs talk a lot about it, but actually don't think twice about flying 30 minutes to an away game, for example, or, or partnering with a, uh, a major em emitter, Dale Vince, who's going to be uh, in the room a bit later if he's not here already. You know, doing great work at Forest Green Rovers, as we know, and hopefully more football clubs will see that as actually a good business idea. Because isn't that the thing, Jane, as well? You know, this is business critical in, in many respects because we're talking about the very existence of our events and our business. Yeah, I mean, 100%. And it, it will have a knock-on effect sort of preparing for and having to deal with these weathers on the financial side. Um, and something you were just sort of saying there as well, um, I think it's really important because obviously we've worked so hard to get all our events hopefully up to quite a good sustainability level and we work hard on all of that. It's not losing it when these sort of extreme weathers hit and actually knee-jerking and into bad decision-making to try to deal with the bad weather. And ironically, you end up making not sustainable choices because of climate change. Um, I think that's quite an important thing within your sort of company and your event is to make sure that your pre-planning allows you to have things in place such as, you know, a lot of events I've worked with, you know, I have worked at events in the past when you have extreme heat, they'll all of a sudden start handing out plastic bottles because they panic and they're worried about the audience is not having enough water. It's making sure that your pre-planning in advance allows you not to sort of fall back into bad decision making um, and don't lose the core of what we're trying to sort of keep going to actually try to help solve climate change by reacting to climate change. And that's where the Met Office can step in, Rick, right, and, and help with some of that planning? I, I think so. I think you know, my, my question to everybody is, in the plans that you have, how many of you are planning for something you've never seen before? You know, we tend to plan on weather events and, and crowd events that um, you can look back on and say, well, this happened, okay, we've learned a lesson from that, we'll do this differently next time. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at unprecedented events in the UK. How do you plan for that? So, you know, this is where organisations like the Met Office, you know, want to feed information in to, to planners, into the industry, uh, to help you think about these things. And, and the other aspect of it, which, which you mentioned, I mean, which is also really important, is the, it's not so much the weather, it's the impact of the weather. So, for example, if, you, if you've got really dry, dusty ground and people are dancing on it, then, you know, that dust kicks up. And you've probably got people in the crowd who have breathing difficulties, 
you know, who, and can trigger some sort of uh, a response. Are, are you prepared for that? Is that something you've seen before? You know, so it's, it's not just the weather itself, it's the impact of um, what that means to people, what that means to our infrastructure. We, did, we didn't know how the UK's infrastructure would work at 40 degrees. You know, we, we, we know now, but what about 41? You know, so you've got to think about these things in a slightly different way. And also, just finally, the implications of the decisions you make, as you, as you said, not just in the sustainability, but also in the safety of people. Because if you send people away from an event, maybe early, because of heavy rain or something, when you send them away, are you sending them into somewhere that's less safe? Are you putting them into more hazard? Because you're unaware of what weather events going on just 20 miles down, down the road. Mm. So, so much to think about. And absolutely, you want That's something to. I was worried about that, that <laughs> night in, in Swindon uh, that I was talking about. It's like, uh, that crossed my mind. It's like, well, actually, how do I know that they're actually being evacuated to an area which is yep. safer? As it turned out, I think by the sounds of it, it was very well managed on the night and they, they got back in and it continued. But um, tough stuff. Um, Arthur, Let's hear a bit more about the technologies that you referenced earlier that, that are so important to developing your, your festival work in Portugal. All right, shall we just presentation? Can we just start this one? All right, so um, we, we would like to share some of the things we are doing at our festival. Um, focus on two points. One is the people, uh, because many times we are talking about sustainability and it looks like we are talking about something out there, but uh, we should put the human, the we should be human-centered as well because we are part of the ecosystem. So, for instance, one of the most important things for us is how can we integrate a good human experience in a landscape. So what you are seeing now is an image of the Boom Festival. It is inland Portugal, around three hours from Lisbon, and we are surrounded by beautiful mountains with beautiful old trees and with uh, around three, water, three kilometers waterfront. Um, if we look at climate change, uh, that is his best-selling author, uh, Yuval Harari, that actually compares climate change as one of the most important existential threats. And we kind of believe in that. Um, and this is why we are trying to look at the human level and we are also looking at the natural level and how we can we develop technologies. So one of the things for us that are really important and why festivals matter is because, as I said before, festivals are a tool for human transformation and land regeneration. And this is what we have been applying at our festival. Um, this is the landscape of Boom. We went, we are people from Lisbon and Porto and we decided in 2002 to go inland to create this event that started in 97 in Portugal. We bring people from all over the world. And we wanted to do not only a cultural event, we also wanted to do a, a regeneration, going into a farm and create a regeneration project. So this is a very beautiful location. We are very remote. It's one of the less densely populated places in Portugal. And since 2010, when we bought our land, we started immediately to build. These are some of the first uh, images of the buildings that we started to do. These are the, <laughs> the beginning of some yoga platforms. We played around a lot with bioconstruction and we still do it a lot. This is done with the local clay. So we, we do clay with the, with the soil that we have there. And this is one of the images of the regions around. This uh, tiny village has 2,000 years of history. It was founded by Romans. In this region, you also can see this really old school uh, integration between human existence and stone. This is a pretty uh, clever way of the humans to deal with the environment at the time. So you can see a, a really beautiful way that humans were living with the uh, surroundings. And this is an inspiration for us. This kind of creative way of the humans is also one important aspect to deal with what is the presence of this uh, region. And we are talking about one of the most hopeless regions in Portugal. So most of the population is elder. Uh, there is lots of immigration, as you can see from the last uh, polls there. Lots of people are moving out. And what we are trying to do is, through the festival, bringing people in. 
People from all over the world come to the festival. They are starting to buy properties there. Our crew is living there. We are opening schools with the local population there. And through the events, we are also inspiring the municipality to do things there. And what we have been applying is based on something called permaculture. And permaculture has a set of principles that for us is giving, as I said before, a toolkit. This toolkit is pretty much uh, an ethics that is related with the human and how the human relates with the environment. And if we have people from all over the world coming to a remote place in Portugal, we need to give them a set of principles. Uh, this is how we as humans can correlate with. So some of the principles that for us are very important there uh, is, I mean, we, I don't need to go into most of these points, but work with nature never again. And going into the nature involves us to have a knowledge about the fluxes, about the water lines, about the small orographies of the land. And through that, we design the festival. And what we have been doing in our festival as well is through the festival, show that it is possible to have a human occupation that is aware, that is conscious. And this is one of the examples, as I said, uh, if you look, this is one of the music areas. And if you look back, you have this mountain that is a, a, a small village. So even on the, the art projects, we like to mimic what is nature. So you have biomimetic architecture there, that is the shape of the human art and we put this in a place that is out of water lines and is integrated with the back scenery of the trees. And if you see in a perspective, we have a big mountain. So this is a kind of approach of working with patterns, natural patterns, working with nature, never again. And this is very inspiring from our um, experience. When people see this, they can really resonate with the message of the festival. It's not an aesthetic, there is depth there. And Nature provides us the tools, we just emphasize that. And regenerative design has also been one of the frameworks for us. How can we look at landscapes and through the human integration? For instance, humans come, we have compost toilets, the compost creates soil, the soil creates uh, more regeneration, and this we can provide food. And through this kind of things, uh, we can create uh, an experience that is immersive while at the same time affects positively the community. Once again, now we saw first this example. This is a, a wider view of what we are trying to do there. So if you can see the way we design the festival is always integrated with the landscape. So we have the trees and you have the gardens and you have the music areas when you have a bit more open spaces and everything is around the lake. So it's designed completely with the natural landscape around. So one of the things that has been really interesting is that in the last years, the, city, the, the region of Idanyanova were picking up from our inspiration and in Idanyanova, that was this hopeless region that, that lost the immigration, now is a city of music of UNESCO. It also uh, turned, this is a Portuguese news, so also turned one of the first bioregions of Portugal. So now they are moving in lots of uh, organic farmers to develop their projects there. And we are also seeing a steady growth of the integration and in, uh, inclusion of people coming from abroad. This is a poll from uh, emigration, people from uh, foreign countries to moving in into that region of Portugal. So in conclusion, a good takeaway is the cultural sector can really create a regeneration, not only on the natural landscape, but also on the social landscape. This is one of the examples. The other example, I can start with a really self-explanatory image. So this image is from Copernicus, this uh, meteorological environmental uh, European one. And this is from the month in Iberian Peninsula from the month where boom 2022 was happening. It's pretty nice to see the color. It could be the flyer of a heavy metal show, for instance, <laughs> or a dark uh, progressive kind of thing. But this is the reality in the Iberian Peninsula nowadays. So, and this one, it shows that in the surface, this was the, the, the temperature in the surface of the soil. The darkest one from 45 to 50 degrees. The less red one, 40 to 45 and 35 to 40. 
and boom is here. Boom is here. So this is the reality of climate change in Portugal. This is the reality that we are facing. And we, this is no fake news. This is Copernicus. This is environmental, European environmental agency. How can we adapt? Things we can control, the cycle of influence and the cycle of concern we cannot control. So this is the reality. How are we adapting? Another reality in Portugal, this is the amount of, uh, this is from the Portuguese uh, Meteorological Institute. The amount of, in the last decade, in the 20th century and the 21st, the amount of rainfall. In blue, the, the normal rainfall, and in brown, the not normal rainfall. So if you can see, as we are approaching the, the end, less rainfall and more abnormal circumstances. So not only we are facing huge amount of temperature peaks, heat waves, we are also facing lots of lack of water, lots of moments of water scarcity. Again, image during the time of boom, best times. The Portuguese territory with extreme drought. All the territory with drought, as you can see, the brown and the darkest brown, extreme drought. 100% of the territory in drought. Again, and you get on extreme heat waves. This has created a big issue for all the festival promoters and the cultural sector because the government passed a law that from uh, June to September you cannot do any kind of sports, cultural, pilgrimages, etc. in forest areas. So we are facing a big, big problem. So instead of the government to regulate pro things to happen, they are regulating to, for prohibiting, to preventing human and the nature to be in an icon. So we believe this is not the way. So one of the things that we are doing, as you can see here, once again, is work with nature never again. Again, so we are, what we are trying to do is looking at the landscape and what the elders were doing in the past, water retain, retention ponds. We created a new water treatment system. This can uh, treat and uh, um, hold seven million liters of water that is pretty much what is consumed. The water comes from the grid. We retain the water and now we are doing some tests to treat all the water and we can use it either for irrigation or for regeneration. As this is a, uh, like a small video. As you can see, this is from one of the top parts. The festival is close to the river, close to the dam. And all around we have forests. This for the officials, for the government officials is a nightmare because we have a forest area with the wildfire is, is a big mess. But due to these kind of measures, again, inspired by permaculture, we can mitigate these issues. And not only we can reintroduce the water, we can use the water to regeneration. We can use the water for the showers. We know that the festival might have issues of water because there is less water, scarce, less water available, more water scarcity. But with this kind of technologies, we can be one step forward. And hopefully we can maintain this kind of images. This is one of the image, and this is the last slide. <laughs> this is uh, the one image at night. It's a beautiful space you in the, in the like amazing uh, scenery. And with this kind of technologies, we believe we can adapt to climate change on a positive level. So some of the technologies, there are more, but at least we believe these are some of the most um, important ones for this context. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. Very good. Um, I, I just, I'm sure some people have got some burning questions for Arthur. There. I, I know I said we'd save questions for the end, but if anyone wants to ask Arthur anything specifically on what he's just presented there, now might be a good time. Yeah, hi. There is a microphone coming, by the way. Hang on just one second. There we go. Um, completely agree with you. Is it work? Yes. Uh, completely agree with you that uh, working alongside with nature, together with nature, getting inspired by the principles of permaculture and learning from indigenous knowledge, very important uh, for festivals. So, oh, getting a bit worried, you know. <laughs> um, my question is as follows How do you? Uh, teach uh, 40,000 people 
coming to your festival, the principles of permaculture, the principles of respecting the local land, if they're not familiar with the local land, how do you teach them in a short period of time to kind of go uh, together with your values? I think there are, there are mi many, many ways, but one of the main points is to, lead, to, to, to teach by example and to lead by example. So some of the things that we should do that are one part of this kind of knowledge goes into the program. So this is one approach which is more intellectual. So we, we teach this in the official program on many ways, but especially we have experiential approaches on this. So if you go to a toilet, if the toilet is there and if it's comfortable and if you show all the cycles, people can learn from that by using it. So once again, we draw lots of inspiration from this design, human-centered design thinking, human-centered principles, so that people can really understand what is going on. One of the things, for instance, that it's, the, the, we are a bit focused on the water level, and the water, one of the things that we were a bit worried is that we prevent during some times, the running times of the showers at the festival, so that people understand that water is limited there. And we run a, a questionnaire in the end of the festival and 92% of the audience, they understood that it was very important to limit the, the, water, the shower times because water is scarce in that region. So what we are trying to do is first, we integrate some of this knowledge in the official program. And second, we present some technologies there so that people can experience firsthand what we are doing there. Great, thank you. And uh, second question sort of related to that. Um, of course, permaculture and regeneration principles are very much based on protecting biodiversity. So how is that possible to do in the framework of a festival? And how do you measure if biodiversity has been not affected or affected at the end of each festival? We have a good advantage because we do our festival in a land that is ours. So we test a lot of the biodiversity uh, situations and initiatives that we do there, the amount of reforestation, the amount of new species, the amount of shrubs, the amount of animals, the amount of things that we do that we regenerate there, we are pretty uh, amazed by the level of regeneration that we create there. So we measure firsthand the amount of biodiversity we integrate and not the amount of biodiversity we deplete with the festival. Because one of the good things of having a land is that the approach that humans are not compatible with nature, we can destroy that. The amount of new species that we integrated in the land is amazing. The amount of, there is a small reptile that in Portugal we call Sardão. The amount of uh, new reptiles that are born only because of the water ponds, it's something overwhelmed. So it's very important also to understand that from the moment you have food, and from the moment you bring ingredients into a natural setting, even if you have a bit of stress on the land, right after the humans go away, the amount of animals are there. So in our land, we have wild boars, we have many amounts of, of animals, nobody hunts them, nobody kills them, and everything is totally compatible. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Jane, I'm, I'm quite interested in, in your take on Arthur's presentation there. How, how much of what he's doing is transferable, you know, is something that you could implement at Glastonbury or Boomtown? How much is more complex because of the land you're working with? Yeah, I mean, I think it does depend on owning the land. Um, yeah. Sort of what you can put in place is massively dictated by sort of how much you're allowed to actually do on the land you're using. So somewhere like Glastonbury, obviously we can implement a lot more um, sort of things, you know, sort of we do compost toilets as well, we bring back some of the soil, we put it in our, perm our permaculture gardens, um, land drainage, we've got, you know, um, different wetlands, we're building more wetlands on the, s on the event site. Somewhere like Boomtown is slightly more difficult because obviously you don't own the land, so being able to implement um, some of the great works you're doing is, is more difficult, and when you're, you are a temporary event and you're just on a site for, say, two months, it's actually quite hard to really sort of to be able to really have an impact like you're saying and introduce wildlife back to your field you need to really sort of your roots need to go into the land and you need to be there all year round and you need to be sort of working on the land i feel um so i think it is important if possible but it's one of the hardest things to do is to own your event space yeah. um as an industry we're so temporary and we're so in between everywhere 
it's very hard to sort of really get your roots um, deep. And what about that point about the, you know, the customers, the audience, respecting the land as well, respecting nature, working with nature rather than against nature? You know, we'd like to think that we probably would if we went to a festival tomorrow, but does everyone? Prob probably not. How, how do you get a handle on that? How do you encourage more, more positive interaction, I suppose? I think it is changing. I think people are more um, open to sort of that sort of interaction. I think society is slowly pushing that way anyway. So, you know, 15 years ago at events, it was sort of the more niche events that were pushing and sort of trying to get people to look into permaculture and look into recycling and using compost toilets is actually more of the norm now across um, you know, multiple events. So I think because society has sort of been, thankfully, re you know, sort of the last few years starting to wake up and sort of open people's eyes a lot more to this sort of storyline, I, th I think people are more open to it, um, but it does depend on the event. Because um, like you said before, people, it's entertainment. Some people just want to go have a good time and not really think about the impact they're having. So it's sort of almost... You have to, you know, like working with the land and knowing the land, you have to know your audience. You don't want to sort of put people off with certain events and you don't want to sort of become a lecture. Yeah. Um, so, it's no, you know, some pe some events do want that and, you know, you're, you're preaching to the converted already and it's a great space, but sometimes you have to do it really subtly. Um, I think that's, that's really important, isn't it? And it's something we find in, in sport a lot, is getting the, getting the tone of the conversation is as important, if not more important, than actually what we're doing practically from an operational point of view. How do you get that message across? Is it like by emphasizing the doom and gloom angle? You know, this event is not going to be here mm. in five years' time, ten years' time, if we don't do something about it now? Or is it sort of accentuating the positive, uh, the work we can do? Wh where do you see that, that balance, Arthur? I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is. Probably somewhere in the middle. But yeah. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, in one way, I think it's important to have, as, as I said before, there is, is the policy makers are a bit disconnected, but I think the, the public policies, they, they have a big impact, you know. Imagine that from now on, all the sports events, they are prohibited overnight. You save a lot of energy only on lights, energy consumption. So I think the policy makers, they really need to step up for this. Otherwise, it's just on the private level, and on the private level, there are many forces, there are commercial forces, lobbying, etc. And if there is no policy makers that can homogenize the, 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 the regulations of the events, can be the cultural events or the sporting events, I think it's going to be a bit more difficult for us to have a, like some coherence, coherent approach in terms of attracting people to be either for a sporting event or for a cultural event it's going to be more difficult for them to engage with the, with the grand view of things, which is climate change. That's where we as consumers do actually have a reasonable amount of power because we can decide who we support, which clubs we buy tickets from, which clubs we buy merchandise from. We can decide which festivals we want to buy tickets to and take our family to in the summer. And ultimately, we can decide who we vote for. So really, when you talk about influencing policy change, there is there is power at our disposal. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think also, I mean, talking with sports, I think the, the sports people need to step up also in terms of activism, yeah, in agree. terms of yeah. activism as well. I think the musicians and the people in the cultural sector, they've been really strong on that for decades. And the sports people, they are kind of in a bubble and they don't want to step up for that. And I, I think there is a lot of room to improve on that as well. Totally agree, totally agree. We find it a lot. There's, there's a sort of fear of hypocrisy almost, yeah. I think, in sport especially, that because sport is so global, um, you know, you need... Like on the tennis, I worked on the tennis tour for 10 years and it is a global tour for 11 months of the year and the whole nature of it is that you fly from continent to continent but as a lot of people have, that I've interviewed have made the point, well, that is what sport is. It's not going to stop being yeah, a global yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, business sure. but we can still influence. That doesn't mean a rugby player or a tennis player has taken a flight to get to their last match doesn't mean they can't have a view in terms of trying to influence people's opinion in a positive way. Yeah. So I think that if we can dispel that fear of hypocrisy and have these conversations more openly, that's yeah. why having these conversations is so good, isn't it? Rick, what more can events do to engage with the Met Office to help with, with planning? If any event maybe needs a bit more advice on future planning, 
where, where can they go? What's the best way of connecting? Um, <coughs> I think, you know, I'd encourage you to get tuned in to what's happening with the weather, and it doesn't have to be through the Met Office. There's a number of um, meteorological agencies and organisations who can, who can help you. Um, I think it, it's also about, you know, the, the experience of people who go to these events. So when you think about weather, it's maybe not just looking for the extremes, but, you know, what, what can you do to make the whole experience of travelling from, from your house to a, an event and back home again, you know, uh, a lot better. And, you know, the, the weather affects every part of that. It affects your journey, uh, it affects your experience at the event, it ex affects your, your journey home. You know, so um, who can you work with? What other organisations can you work with that uh, can link around the weather story to, to make sure that that experience is, is better? You know, so who, who can you um, work with to offer travel advice? to people going to festivals, for example. You know, if you know there's going to be severe weather around, people might want to change their travel plans. Can you sort of help out in, in that area? So I think, I think, you know, talk to people who can provide weather information, but also talk to people who can use that information to make the whole experience uh, safer, but also better. Yeah. And not, better f not just better for the people, but better for the planet as well. And just with your weather forecaster's hat on, you can basically tell us what's going to happen from what, like 10 days in advance? Would <coughs> that be? Yeah, I, I, th I think you can rely on anything, you know, out to five, six days ahead. And, and I would encourage you to look at different forecasts to see how consistent they are. Um, you know, so five, five, six, seven days is a reasonable shout now. Um, what's the best app? <laughs> Most of them are wrong from my experience. <laughs> so, the, here's, so this is where you could help. This is where the industry could really help us. You know, that, so um, we carry the national severe weather warnings, which are the, the, the key things. This is what the responder community operate on. So if there's a red warning out, then all sorts of uh, agencies get involved in trying to keep people safe and keep the infrastructure going. But we recognise that a lot of the younger generation in particular, but probably people who go to festivals and events won't use the Met Office app because it's the sort of thing that I use, you know? <laughs> so <coughs> so how, how can we get uh, weather information, and particularly warnings, through the channels that you're using to engage with uh, the people that are coming to your events? And if the, that's one thing that we could do is get information out to people who uh, are using your channels, that would be fantastic. Let's open it up for any more questions from the floor. Hello, sir, right at the back. Microphone's coming your way. Number two. Uh, Steve Heaton, the Association of Festival Organisers. Question is for Artur. Um, thank you very much for the amazing trailblazing work you're doing. It's fantastic. Um, do your local and national governments actually support you, both morally and financially? Financially, no. <laughs> but we also don't want their money uh, because we want to s remain independent. Um, morally, I have to say that, I mean, we don't like to mingle too much with politicians and politics because that's a tricky, swampy way. Um, but surely there is goodwill around us because they look at us as these alternative people that don't want any kind of funding and they are from the cultural sector that for them is a bit cognitive dissonance, um, while at the same time they allow us to do this kind of experiments that sometimes are not regulated, but because everything that you see here, we also have some um, ag agreements with universities that test everything. So they can see that ev all the testing is also scientifically uh, approved, and so they allow us to develop this kind of approaches. Um, I mean, this Friday I'm going to have a, me uh, a meeting with the Ministry of Environment. So I would say that they allow us to happen. They, they have a big curiosity about what we are doing. They don't support us. Um, but there is always this unstable way that policy making sometimes, they have these blind regulations that no matter if you have good connections with them or not, you can just be prevented of, of doing the event. And this is what happened last time. They created this new law that was preventing everything to happen during the peak uh, heat waves. And we were really at the verge of not doing the event at all. 
And again, with this, with the right contacts and with the right, uh, with the right connections with the policy makers, we could do the event. But still, it's something that we, we like to be close, but we don't, we don't like to be too involved. Thank you for that. Could, could you um, make yourselves available for an appointment with the Department of Culture, Media and Sport? <laughs> I, I think you could do a great presentation that might just change their mind. Thank cool. You. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I, Andy Rice from Major Events International. I'd just like to echo Steve's um, endorsement uh, and congratulations on that presentation, Arthur. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of festival organizers in the room um, that are interested in what you do year round. Most festivals have greenfield sites, some owned, some rented. Um, obviously, the big challenge is getting some revenue throughout the year. Your event, I assume, is a week in the summer. If you could clarify when it is and how long it is, that would be helpful. But what else do you do during that period to try and keep some revenues coming in? What we do, so we have the one event, uh, Boom Festival, then we have another event on the following year called the Green Gathering, normally. And uh, the months of uh, autumn and winter, it's just regeneration. We don't do nothing during the, those months in the land. So we work during springtime and uh, summertime. We open the gates during uh, summertime. And normally our activity goes like we started the build of the events around spring, then we open the gates summertime. After that, we also do some courses at the Boomland. So we have uh, permaculture courses. Now we're gonna have an agroforestry course. We have a holistic health course. We have an agreement with the with the institute in uh, educational institute in Lisbon that provides us the, the pedagogical uh, things. And we started with the pandemic, which was good. The pandemic as well. We started a good a new a new approach, which is our event called the Being Gathering. is focused on yoga and well-being. It's a 5,000 event, but we created something called the Being Camp, which is going to be for uh, around two months, which is like a holistic camp focus on well-being and yoga meditation. So we are very busy during the times of we open the doors for the, for, the, for the audience. We also do some consultancy from some municipalities in Portugal. We rent out some of the artworks that we have there. And during the rest of the year, we have a crew working in the land because as you know, working with nature is, there is never a day equal like the other one. It's always busy, there is always challenges. So it's, it's we still 90%, 98% of our revenue comes from boom. Um, but we are working on other uh, ways, but the boom is a costly event as well. So we have many activities, the land is done and we have six months period of full regeneration. Nothing happens there, only regenerative work. And how many, how many days is boom festival? One week. One week. And how many in the audience? 40,000 around. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, yeah, um, uh, Rebecca Stewart from Cambridge Folk Festival. Um, it's more just a thought, and I'd really like the panelists' kind of view on it as well. Um, so in the UK, um, independent festivals are becoming more and more kind of unique um, as the costs go up and we're struggling more and more to remain independent. Um, there's a lot of you know talk from the bigger companies around like the sustainability work that they're doing, but in order to remain independent and sustainable, it is becoming so much harder in the UK. And it, would, it was just to see what thoughts anybody had on that about, you know, the, 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 this is going to become harder and harder. And, uh, you know, Jane alluded to that when she was talking about, um, you know, preventing things and, and your forward planning and stuff. But just any, any thoughts on that in terms of how the future might look in, in the UK, particularly along that festival route, would be really interesting. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think it is about the planning, um, sort of like you're saying, to remain, to not sort of get swallowed up by the big companies that can provide the money, that can sort of solve those issues. I think it's um, the pricing of your tickets and things like that. Also, I, I know you, don't, you wouldn't want to price out people coming, so it's very hard to get the balance. I don't actually think I have the answer, if I'm honest, um, because that's the nature of it at the minute, because we don't really know always what we're preparing for, so you almost have to prepare for everything, and that's costly. Um, 
So I think it's it's in the planning and sort of a long term plan that incorporates being prepared for the climate changes, I think is is your best bet. What what's the biggest challenge you're you're facing in Cambridge? Would you say? Um, I think I think mostly because we are uh, we're, we have quite a unique event in the fact that we're we're owned by a local authority, um, but within within that has its you know we we're we're back we're backed, but also within that we have an expectation on um, you know the local authorities are struggling and we're an income stream for that local authority, so there's there's pressures on the events as well as targets that the local authorities are wanting to meet in terms of their. Um, climate, um, like you know, mo most um, most councils within England have declared a climate emergency, so they're all working towards that, which is amazing, and very fortunate that there's been a lot of work that's been done with Cambridge in terms of you know sustainability. But we're still so much further behind in terms of that, and then how we move forward as an event. So I think, I think you know, I, I know it's, a, it's an unanswerable question, <laughs> but it was just, it's just interesting to hear what other people's kind of perspectives are on stuff, because some days it seems like everything's quite rosy and other days maybe not so much, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it turned into a bit of a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, keep, keep fighting the good fight, keep, keep going. I mean, that, that is a very fair point, isn't it? You know, to bring smaller events up to, up, up to s speed, if you like, on sustainability, invariably is going to cost money. Um, how, how can you do that without putting a hit on ticket prices? I think there is no other way. You know, it's, uh, if we want to step, back, step up on quality and um, if you want to deliver on sustainability, you need to have the resources to do it and they need to be financial as well. I think on the learn, if there is a business plan, if we always, I mean, in our concept, owning a land is a game changer. Because if we work with, with, with environmental and climate change, if we own the land, maybe we invest a lot in the beginning, but on the long term, the cost will be lower because you're gonna still investing. And a land is also a differentiation aspect for the audience. And with the amount of festivals all around, people will look for the differentiation part and people will look for the community part. People will look for the land part. It's not only about the program or the lineup or the artist anymore. It's, it's much more than that. And I believe that special independent festivals, if they can differentiate with like a community space and integrity, I think that, that can be a really good way to, to developing, to grow and to make things more sustainable. I think we're all very jealous about your land and the fact that you own it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful site, isn't it's it? And clearly, you do a lot of, a lot of good work there. It's, it's, a, it's, a team, it's a team sport. <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. A few more questions. Hello. Is this working? There we go. I think I'm going to start with a, a thought. From right at the beginning when you had said, uh, I think two of you had said, we were very surprised to hit 40 degrees in the UK, but of course we shouldn't be. That's not a surprise at all. We all knew where this was headed. And then I got thinking about the Met Office being a bit of a crystal ball. The Met Office knows where we're headed. <laughs> we we uh, probably better than most people. And uh, that moved into, of course, the inevitable, where's the legislation? And I just wonder if the Met Office, given their unique positioning, is doing any work on pressurizing for legislation, is turning into a bit of a climate lobbyist group, um, given all of the data you have at your fingertips? Thank you, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's an excellent question. Yeah. I, I think the surprise is more based on the history, isn't it? I, I don't think in any way we were s suggesting it was never gonna happen, but yeah, we'd, we'd never seen it before, so. Yeah. yeah, what about that point, Rick? Can you become more of a sort of uh, lobbying organization? So, so just, the, just to answer the 40 degree one, it, yeah, it was coming. Um, it's, it, what you don't know is when. This year, next five years, next 10 years. Um, and I think that's one of the key points of climate change is that you understand the big drivers. We understand that we're heading towards, you know, as things are, we're heading towards a three degree temperature rise across the planet. We've already ticked off a degree of that now, even in the UK. 
um, how that manifests itself into weather events on a day-by-day -day basis is still work to do. You know, we've still got to work in those areas, and we're doing that all the time. We've got a, a new team together now who looks at uh, unprecedented events. You know, wh what can we expect in, in where the climate is now? Are we lob lobbying? I mean, we're involved in the COP uh, meetings that happen every few years. We're feeding information into the mix all of the time. The Hadley Climate Centre, which uh, is part of the Met Office and sits upstairs from, from where I'm based, uh, um, some of the top scientists in the world are collaborating with every other uh, climate centre to try and feed more information in. But you've got to do it on evidence-based information, and which is really tricky because it's a passionate thing for all of us. And we, we all look at what potentially is happening um, we just got to keep feeding the information in and encouraging the conversations and encouraging. So lobbying, yes, we are, but we do that from a scientific evidence-based point rather than a political one, if that makes sense. Keith. And just, just behind. I have a question on the rubric um, on chain, and then maybe if we have time for after afterwards. But um, Rick, from your perspective, obviously there's a slight difference between festivals that are aimed at, that um, are situated in the countryside compared to urban centres, because we are um, exuberated by the urban heat island effect. So, from your perspective, is there a way that we can um, adapt? extreme like situation protocols or would it be kind of micro um, habitat monitoring would that influence and help our information that we have and that you have to be able to plan better for those different areas and sites um, and, and that's a really good point and that's one of the challenges that are facing meteorologists at the moment is how do you model small scale uh, weather events in urban areas where you've got tall buildings, you've got uh, alleyways that funnel wind. You know, I, I know of, of one football club that suffers with uh, things being blown over when the wind's in a specific direction because it funnels between tower blocks. You know, so to get down to that, you've, you have to be modeling at uh, tens to 100 meter scales, which takes enormous computing power. So there is going to be a challenge for some years to come to try and understand the subtleties in, in, urban, in urban areas. How, how do you sort of adapt? I think, <coughs> I think it's sort of understanding the, the threats and the environment around you and thinking about, so if you have flash flooding, um, which it is going to be more of a problem in an urban area because of concrete and you're reliant on the drains, it's understanding where that water's going to go where, where are people most at risk from flash flooding I in an urban environment, which, might <coughs> which we've seen in, in Germany and, uh, and in America recently, the, the, the subways, the tube stations, are areas where you don't want to be necessarily during these sort of storms. So it's understanding that, <coughs> and it's adapting your plans to try and ensure that you keep people as safe and comfortable as possible. Um, yeah. Do you think that... Um, microhabitat, uh, microclimate monitoring would be beneficial to start doing at places like festival sites and things like that? Could that be a revenue of information that could be maybe fed in with the, with the bar safe data sets that the Met Office have, obviously? Absolutely. More information that comes in, mm. then we can fine-tune uh, our view of to me, it's, it's not just the weather. What's really important now is the impact of that. So what I'd like to see is the ability to be able to measure the impact and people's responses as much as we measure temperature and rainfall, if that makes sense. So uh, actually being able to gather information from social networks, social media networks, is really quite a powerful thing because it helps us understand what the weather means because it's the impact, actually, that's the most important thing. Which is why it's so important to know your land yeah. is to go there for you know whatever the weather all year round go and look how your sort of site is reacting to different weathers and learn 
learn from your land. It would, it would tell you how to set up your site. Right. It would teach you. <laughs> We're heading into a break now, but I'm sure there'll be a chance to put any further questions or have a chat with Arthur, Rick, and, uh, and Jane over the next half an hour or so. Uh, I must let you know that while the break is going on here in room one, there is a session that's going to be starting soon in room two uh, on European Green Festival Roadmap, so do attend that if you want. But for now, thank you very much, and please give a big hand to Jane Healy, Rick Robbins, and Arta Mendes.